I'm Dr. John Oldham, Chief of Staff at the Menninger Clinic. Welcome to Menninger Mindscape, which is our series of podcasts where we try to bring you some interesting information about the field of psychiatry and introduce you to some pretty remarkable people. And I'm delighted we have one such person with us today, Dr. Helen Mayberg. Um, we're delighted that you're with us today. Dr. Mayberg is here uh, to give the 2013 Joan and Stanford Alexander Award Lecture uh, in Psychiatry, which was set up to honor Dr. Stuart Yudowsky, Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Baylor College of Medicine. So we're wonderfully delighted to have you here on the Menninger campus today, Dr. Mayberg. Dr. Mayberg is Professor of Neurology, Psychiatry, and Radiology at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, and I'll get this right, is also the Dorothy C. Fuqua Chair of Psychiatric Neuroimaging and Therapeutics at Emory. Um, it's really wonderful to have a minute or two to talk about the work that you're going to tell us a lot more about later today. Uh, but we thought it'd be fun to just hit a few of the high points. I know you're going to be talking about some really pioneering and, and, and quite important work um, as, as new intervention treatments for depression, and maybe particularly serious depression that hasn't responded to more routine types of treatment. One example of which, and you've been a pioneer in this field, is deep brain stimulation. So let me stop chattering and let's hear a little bit from you about a few highlights of what you're going to talk about later today. Well, what I'm going to do is go over really the rationale for implanting electrodes in the brain to try to tune brain circuits and to pinpoint those areas of the brain that seem to be most important for depression. And while everyone's very interested in the clinical outcomes and kind of where we are now, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about what was our thinking 10 years ago to think that we'd be in the position to implant in a particular location in the brain and think we could pace the brain in any kind of way that could get people that really have failed drug, all the psychotherapies, and even electroconvulsive shock therapy, how to get them out of that severe chronic state. So I'm going to go over a lot of how we've gone about mapping depression circuits and how we work to kind of pinpoint by using how the brain changes with different treatments, what regions might really be a hub, kind of a central station, an intersection of brain pathways that seem to be critical for depression itself. That, that is so exciting. That, now, can, it can be hard to do in a few words, but can you say about how, how did you or we or the, all the research community figure out where it was in the brain that you needed to go uh, to try to make a difference with regard to depression? Well, you know, this is how neurologists think. And, you know, 25 years ago when brain imaging came to be, we had conceptual models about psychology and chemistry, but really all of these things work in the brain and the question is where. And neurology works to really try to deconstruct complex behavior into its component brain areas. And brain areas don't work alone, they work in combination with their friends in ensembles. And by using techniques like PET scanning or positron emission tomography where you can map brain metabolism, we and many other groups literally put depressed people in the scanner, put healthy people in the scanner and said, where is metabolism different? Mm -hmm. And through the technology and the evolution of the technology, we could literally, in three-dimensional space, map those brain areas that weren't working normally. And then we could move to study people who had bipolar, unipolar, or obsessive compulsive disorder and depression. We actually started out by studying neurological patients, people with Parkinson's mm -hmm. or Alzheimer's right. or Huntington's, all who can have a prominent depression and said, look, if we can't see depression in neurological patients, I'm going home. Mm -hmm. And so that was my approach. And as we started to see that there were similar maps similar abnormal metabolic maps in depressed patients, we moved on to look at how does the brain change when you respond to a medication? And then it became important, well, how is it different when you don't respond to a medication? What's happening to your brain? And we said, well, is it different if you're treated with cognitive therapy compared to a drug? And we started to pick up the nuances of how brain areas were working together. And then over time, we started to hone in on 
the sad part, the negative mood part, which was so crucial to the illness, seemed to involve the very areas that we turned down activity across all the mm -hmm. treatments. So we had sort of an educated guess about the convergence of findings that a particular area in the anterior cingulate has a number, the anatomist, name it, area 25, mm -hmm. seem to be vital to both mediating negative mood and how emotion impacts thinking, but also seem to be a critical target to modulate across treatments. So we said if you really can't talk it right or drug it right or shock it right, maybe we can implant there directly in tune it. Mm -hmm. And that became the rationale and we took advantage of you know, at that point, it was 10, 15 years of experience with brain implantation in Parkinson's. So we had very experienced surgeons. We had a circuit, and unlike Parkinson's disease, ours was specific to mood. And so we targeted what we thought was the most critical node and looked to see what would happen. I mean, it is such pioneering work, and it's also highly courageous. It's a very difficult thing to do, but it has really moved the field um, and helped us understand. I, for many reasons, one of a different reasons slightly, I'd like to clone you and take you with me, talking to all kinds of audiences, because one of the things that's implied by what you're saying is that depression, which is very prevalent and very high risk, is a brain disorder. We were talking earlier about the problem of stigma and how people are really reluctant to say that they have depression or anything that has the label of psychiatric illness or mental illness, but there's a brain disorder. And what you're looking at is where the location in the brain is and how you can make a difference. Um, give us an example of a real success story as just one that might occur to you in the work that you've done. Well, we have a patient that was actually highlighted. She was interviewed. We've had several patients highlighted by the media. But to see a young woman, mother of three, who um, didn't have a family history, really didn't have any obvious risk factors in her early 30s, get a major depressive episode. She was a nurse, kind of a traveling nurse, taking care of high-risk um, pregnant, unmarried young women. And her husband was in the military, who suddenly developed depressive symptoms and first had some psychotherapy, not successful, added some medication, not successful, added a series of medications, all unsuccessful. And over the course of a number of months, then a year, needed to be hospitalized and actually was hospitalized for a long period of time with repeated ECT with absolutely no response. So again, a uh, more unusual presentation, most of our patients have been those that have done very well in the early days, first episodes, where they've had a treatment and recovered, had a recurrent episode, haven't recovered quite as well, and have had sort of a progressive path. But this um, woman actually had been repeatedly treated with no response and um, had a I'll never forget the night before surgery to ask her, what's the one symptom that if you could get rid of it would make your life different? She said, I'd really like to hold my children and feel them. And it was the most profoundly eloquent and simple way to capture what is the most destructive element of depression because it's such an internal feeling state but the fact that you can't, you lose the machinery of your brain to even reach out mm -hmm. to other people to help you is something quite profound and that we've tried to study. But I'll never forget on the operating room table, you know, we do testing and we do you know, repeated testing at different contacts because we have various sites in the brain that we can stimulate um, after we implant the electrode. And we turned uh, contact on and started to turn it up. And, she kind of grabs my hand because I stand on the side, not where the surgery is being done, but on the front side of the patient. She says, you know, I know you've been with me and you're here to help me. And she goes, but all of a sudden, I just feel more connected to you. Isn't that interesting? And the surgeon who was controlling the stimulator turned it down and she said, well, I, I sort of cognitively feel connected to you, but that feeling just went away. And you know, the subtlety of this intervention 
depression doesn't go away on the table, but something about the break comes off. And we have an opportunity to learn about the enslavement of depression in a very, very unusual way because we're watching it in real time. Mm -hmm. And she went on to do quite well. But another critical thing I learned from her, and she was patient number six in the very first cohort, was as we got into three, four months, she says, you know, getting well is actually not what I expected. It was everything she wanted, but the process of recovery was tougher than she had imagined. And she says, you know, it's almost like I have to learn how to feel mm -hmm. real negative emotion because whatever I was feeling before was very abnormal. And now just getting used to real life takes some work. Well, that's, that's very interesting. And of course, it's not just turning a switch. You have to turn the switch, or at least in this case, it made a big difference. But then it's like a relearning process. Um, very interesting, because she must have had depression just completely savaging her capacity to function for a long stretch. This is, I think, the real take-home message as we learn what brain stimulation does, is actually to appreciate we return the brain to its owner. Uh -huh. And that, in fact, the hard work happens once the brain is working. Because if you've been ill four or five years in a very maladaptive place, just staying alive, once your brain is working, you've got to relearn how to use it. In the same way as if you have a bad hip, you can favor it, your back is bad, mm -hmm. your other leg is bad, and you're out of shape. Yeah. The hip replacement, once you actually get the hip replacement done, it's not simple, but if it's done properly, hip is new. Mm -hmm. Now you gotta learn how to use it. And not everybody runs a marathon the day after surgery. Terrific and sometimes, example. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. Every, people never run a marathon, but at least they have a hip that works, and with this we hope they have a brain that works. Well, I mean, that is so, so compelling, and I wish we had more time and we just have to stop in a minute, but I guess maybe a frustrating part of anybody viewing this might be that this is not ready for prime time yet. This is research, it's pioneering research. But can you say a little just closing word or two about how you see the future? When will not maybe this particular surgical technique, although that's something we hope will become available in cases where it really is the only way to go, but are there other technologies that are going to help guide by brain imaging and ability to look at the brain specific individual treatment recommendations for any given person? I think you bring up an absolutely important point. I think there's going to be relatively few patients, thank God, that are appropriate for a brain surgery. On the other hand, we need to do better at matching people for the treatment that is best for their brain. We've talked about forever how to classify different groups of depressed people. And we're not good at just using symptoms to do it. And we're learning through the very same brain technologies that have allowed us to study how therapy works or drug works on the brain, how it changes, to realize that different kinds of patients actually start from a different place. Mm -hmm. And that one can map the differences. And we and others are working now to actually get people the treatment that matches what their brain needs. You know, we do this all the time. If you have an infection, we don't flip a coin. A patient doesn't pick what, what antibiotic they think they prefer. We grow the organisms and culture, and we treat with the most appropriate antibiotic. And I think we're moving, the field is moving forward so that we can map the state of the brain in different configurations. It all looks like depression, just like an infection in your lung is an infection in your lung until you know what the organism is. And we match so that people get the treatment they need and we avoid won't work. And I think we'll be in a position to actually get people better faster. And we may even learn that we're avoiding doing some harm by giving people things that aren't quite right for them and moving them off course. That's so exciting. And I, I was telling you earlier about our research protocol that we've begun here called MindMB, where we're doing brain imaging and trying to look at relationship between what the imaging studies show and the clinical picture of the patient, and also doing some genetic 
the uh, sequencing as well. We hope that this will inform us in the very way that you're talking about. This is fabulous. This is the future, and I think for the clinic to be moving in that direction, to begin to collect information, to have patients feel a partnership with their physicians and caregivers so that we all work together to figure out how to solve these very, very difficult problems because it isn't simple, but I think teamwork will um, get us far as we move forward. Helen, thank you very much for joining us. This has been just a great peek at a little bit of the work that you're doing, uh, and it's an enormous privilege to hear about it, and we'll learn more about it later today. My pleasure. Um, and thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time.